Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm Jennifer Carpenter. I'm uh, uh, from Stern's Finance Department, and um, I have a, a, a great new interest in uh, what's going on in China, and I've been studying it now for the last three or four years. So it's my, uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to moderate this uh, session on initial public offerings by Chinese technology firms. Um, thank you very much, Dave, for inviting me. I think this is a really important issue, certainly coming from the finance side. I think it's, um, it's an issue really at the nexus of, on the one hand, technology and its role uh, in interaction with the real economy, and also uh, in the intersection, in that same intersection with finance and accounting, because on the accounting side, there's all these uh, disclosure and transparency issues, um, which are clearly essential for the finance side, which gets into these valuations on the asset pricing side. And also, as we saw, um, which was really brought to life in the Alibaba IPO, on the corporate finance and corporate governance uh, side, because you start to get to issues of ownership and control which Jack Ma was very careful to allocate in the way that presumably served him best, but also in, plausibly served Alibaba best, at least in his view. And, um, and then it finally interacts um, with, with internet finance. So one of Jack Ma's genius was to put savings accounts next to his uh, e-commerce e menu, which additionally fuels demand, uh, much better than linking it to a credit card, which is not something that, uh, that has the same uh, kind of um, connotation as a savings account. So uh, in China, there, there's sort of cultural differences in, in the way consumer finance is used. So, uh, and then it was also interesting to see Jack Ma carve out the internet finance piece of Alibaba and keep it for himself. That's not what he sold. But that doesn't mean that that internet finance arm isn't a big part of the value of the piece that he did sell. So uh, there's, a, we, <laughs> there's a smorgasbord of issues here to discuss. And um, we're very fortunate to have two experts in the area help, help guide our thinking on, on a wide range of issues here. We've got Kevin Rosier, who's uh, from the uh, US-China Economic and Security Review Commission, and Raman Chikara, who's from the Global, uh, Global Technology uh, PwC. So um, let's, I know we're on a tight schedule, and Dave gave me a hard stop at 12.20, and I'm going to respect that. So um, perhaps each speaker will give us 12 minutes, and then we'll open it up to audience questioning, and, and I may push a few questions of my own if there's time. All right. So um, Kevin, do you want to get started? Thank you very much. Good morning, and uh, thanks so much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'll just uh, jump right in. Uh, just briefly, uh, the U.S.-China uh, Economic and Security Review Commission is a, a small independent federal government agency uh, commissioned by Congress, reports to Congress on uh, the national security implications of the U.S.-China bilateral economic and trade relationship. Um, and like others, I have to give a brief disclaimer that I, my views today don't represent those of the commission, uh, nor of the U.S. government, but my own personal views. Um, I just want to start by showing a couple of images. Uh, I don't want to repeat too much of what uh, Bill Wyman said, but just to get us off on the same uh, starting point, at least from a policy perspective, um, I want to show this image here is uh, attempting to access the uh, Google Hong Kong site from within mainland China. As you can see, the page is not loaded. Uh, in contrast, this is the view of the New York Stock Exchange uh, the day of the Alibaba IPO. Um, so why am I showing these images? Well, I, I think it's quite symbolic of, at least from a policy and government perspective, where the two countries are coming from, how they view the internet space. Um, I think you know, on the United States side, uh, we view the Chinese internet space as 
you know, high growth potential, great opportunity, um, you know, openness, freedom. We were sort of welcoming it. Um, and on the other side, you know, unfortunately, I, I, I see um, a lot of reservations. Uh, reservations not just on the national security side and on, uh, you know, the question of suppressing uh, domestic dissent or uh, political stability, um, but also, as Bill talked about, uh, you know, part of an industrial policy of, towards protectionism. So looking at that in a little bit more depth, and again, I won't go into too much detail since this was discussed in the earlier presentation, but here's a just side-by-side -side comparison of some of the characteristics um, of the uh, sort of state presence and regulation in the two uh, countries' internet sectors. And on the Chinese side, you've got foreign equity restrictions um, for as a market access barrier, lots of licensing, licensing requirements, censorship regulations that must be uh, conformed to, as was noted, it's a strategic and emerging industry which allows uh, domestic firms to enjoy certain government protections. The basic telecom sector is SOE dominated. There's localization requirements for servers, and the list goes on. On the U.S. side, it's perhaps just the opposite. We've got an extremely open and competitive internet sector, um, you know, very little uh, censorship controls. There's a lot of access to uh, you know, private capital to finance the industry. Um, you know, the telecom sector is competitive among at least a few <laughs> private sector companies. Um, so you can see that the difference is, is quite stark. Um, so I really want to focus on one particular thing that that'll bring us back to the to the topic of the of the panel, which is the the Chinese technology company IPOs. Um, I want to talk about the foreign equity caps. Um, so what we're looking at here is mark, a market access restriction for foreign companies investing in China. So this seems like a bit removed from the topic of IPOs, but I promise it, it'll be related at one point. Um, and the conversation really starts with China's accession in the WTO and how it was agreed that China would be able to protect um, the area that is called value-added telecommunications services. Um, of course, at the time that uh, not only overall WTO negoti negotiations were taking place, but the ones for China's accession, uh, the in internet either didn't exist or was in its infancy. Um, so the category that's called value-added telecommunication services, um, I've listed here some of the specific services that fall under that category um, according to w WTO documentation. Um, China's interpretation is basically any kind of commercial activity that takes place over the internet falls in this category. Why is that important? Well, it means that uh, based on the concessions that were agreed during China's WTO accession, any kind of cross-border commercial activity is not permitted. Um, in a way, this is almost a WTO justification for, say, the Great Firewall. Uh, because it means that, you know, if you are in China and you want to purchase a, a, a music from iTunes, uh, technically, you know, it's not allowed, according to the WTO concessions. Um, so instead, uh, what, was, what was agreed upon was the next item where it says FDI, um, which is requiring foreign companies to enter China, be physically present there, and engage in a joint venture partnership with a uh, domestic Chinese-owned company that has at least 50%. So this is a big concern for the foreign technology companies that want to have a greater presence in China. But what does it have to do with Chinese internet companies listing on US stock exchanges? Well, this requirement would apply as well to Chinese companies. So a Chinese company like the ones we've talked about several times today um, also need to abide by the fact that they can't become a foreign company. They can't have such a large foreign equity presence. So how do they do that? If that's the case, then how is it that Alibaba is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, for example? Um, this was mentioned earlier, uh, the, the, the structure of the VIE. Um, I don't want to spend too much time going into the technicalities of it. I myself am not an expert. Um, but you know, there's lots of uh, documentation out there if you, if you want to read the details. But let's just look quickly at uh, a very simple, simple structure of what this is. Um, I took this directly from Alibaba's um, original SEC F1 filing. Um, if you look at the bottom right, you'll see variable interest entity. Um, so basically, as I said, you need to be a Chinese-owned uh, company, majority-owned company, in order to obtain the licenses to operate as a value-added telecommunications service. 
So what if we think of a case like Alibaba, for example, the licenses that are required, and there are several of them, to have an operation like Alibaba exist in this VIE at the bottom right corner. It is wholly owned by the equity shareholders of the VIE. Those must be PRC citizens. So in the case of Alibaba, it's Jack Ma and Simon Xie. So the other side, the left side, is uh, at the very top left is um, the company that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange, which has, through uh, various uh, shell companies in uh, various tax havens and in Hong Kong, um, wholly, owned, uh, wholly foreign owned enterprises in China. There are multiple ones. Um, and what's the key, what's the core of this uh, graph, in my view, are the dotted lines that connect the wholly foreign owned enterprises and the VIEs. These are essentially um, a slew of uh, legal contracts that allow for equity sharing, um, allow for sort of service agreements, basically make the whole thing work. So what is the point of all this? Well, these legal contracts exist essentially to circumvent the foreign equity restrictions that the Chinese government has put in place. So if I were to ask a Chinese government agency, or any government for that matter, <laughs> this contract is designed to uh, get around the rules you would think that one wouldn't like that. <laughs> At least as a government official, one generally doesn't like one getting around the rules that you've put in place. So um, this is a more detailed version. I'm going to skip that. Um, so what's wrong with these VIEs? Well, in theory, nothing. Um, there, this isn't the only place that, that, that VIE structures are used. Um, but I, my concern is that in the case of China, um, VIEs are seemingly illegal. Um, they are as I said, designed to circumvent certain um, equity restrictions. And even some government, Chinese government agencies have already indicated that they are illegal. Um, and uh, if we, maybe I'll, I'll pass over this, but if we have time, if, if some of you might be familiar with the, um, the Alipay uh, case um, where Alipay was spun off of Alibaba a few years ago, um, this basically gets to the heart of the risk of having this sort of situation because um, actions like that can be taken unilaterally uh, without any imp <coughs> excuse me, input from foreign investors. So here's the bottom line. If the holders of the VIE, so the PRC citizens that, uh, that, that own that en those entities, um, do anything that violate the terms of those dotted lines, all of those various contracts, um, there's really little to no legal recourse that can take place. Those contracts are only enforceable in China. And uh, so if any violation would have to go through the courts in China, and we can discuss perhaps in the Q&A whether or not uh, you think a foreign, um, uh, a foreign um, entity would be successful going through the Chinese courts. I think there's uh, a lot of reason to be skeptical about that. Um, I'm not an investor advisor, so I'm, I'm reluctant to show this slide a little bit, but um, from the conversations I've had with people, you know, investors are obviously assessing risk. And as was noted in, in, uh, by Professor Carpenter at the beginning, um, you know, a lot of the question is about disclosures. I mean, none of this stuff is secret or new. Uh, this is all in the disclosures. Um, and in fact, in the case of Alibaba, more about this was disclosed in subsequent uh, amendments to their SEC filings. Um, so what, do, what might investors think about as they try to assess the level of risk? Well, who are these PRC citizens that own the VIEs? I, I think that seems like it must be quite important because you're putting a lot of trust in those people. Um, another thing that people will look at is how, many, how much of the overall company assets are held in the VIEs versus the wholly foreign owned enterprises. If you put more in the wholly foreign owned enterprises, it gives the investors a sense that they have more control over more of the company's assets. Um, and then, of course, does the stock, stock price reflect the true level of risk, which is you know, up to the individual investor. As a policy person, I'm more interested in the, in the policy implications. Um, it would be helpful, I think, to have a clear answer from the Chinese government as to whether VIEs are legal or not. And the reason I think that's true is because if it is, if, if the Chinese government were to definitively say VI the VIE structure is legal and allowed, the implications would be quite extensive for foreign companies, meaning non-Chinese companies, that want to have a greater presence in China. If they could also take advantage of this, uh, 
that means that they wouldn't have to necessarily find a joint venture partner and they could you know, work through the system. Now, there are some foreign companies that operate in China that do use this structure, but my sense is that they're quite nervous about it because at any moment, they fear the Chinese government might crack down on them. Um, I think there's an issue of, of reciprocity here. I mean, there's, there's limited access for foreign uh, companies in China. I think one you know, blanket thing that could be done, even better than just saying VIEs are legal in China, is just to remove the foreign equity caps that have caused this whole uh, mess to come about to begin with, but the likelihood of that's probably low. And then looking in the US side, um, the question of the, dis the sort of tendency to just disclose more. Whenever we have concerns about these kinds of things, uh, the, and the SEC is sort of under pressure to do something about it, the tendency is just to push the company to disclose more and disclose more. Is that sufficient? Is that sufficient enough to educate US investors about the risks uh, that are inherent in these kind of corporate structures? Or do we need to have uh, more protections in place? And I think this is kind of the beginning of um, a larger presence of not just Chinese technology companies, but other kinds of Chinese entities on US and other foreign, other non-Chinese um, financial markets. Um, and I have sort of a broader concern um, as we perhaps move into a phase where that becomes more commonplace about a sort of legal firewall that exists um, by having you know, multiple shells uh, that are in Hong Kong and in uh, the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, there are really le several levels of protect layers of protection um, that allow Chinese companies to sort of, uh, at least the main parent companies, to exist in the PRC without any, um, um, without being subject to legal jurisdiction in the United States. Um, so I think it's a little bit disheartening for some people to hear that you know there's a major company being uh, traded on a New York. Uh, or, or U.S. stock exchange, and um, but they're not subject to any kind of U.S. laws and such. And, and this could eventually have other implications for other products. Say, for example, other types of financial products that are traded maybe jointly with a U.S. company, um, and there's some sort of dispute, but the Chinese company says, well, we don't, we don't have any presence or assets in the United States. We're not subject to U.S. laws, and we won't uh, show you you know, we won't abide by any sort of court request to uh, disclose any of our, you know, corporate documents. Um, so there are already cases of these kinds of things happening um, that I've heard about anecdotally. Um, I don't think it's quite at the level of what we could call a trend, um, but it's one of these opportunities where we, we know that the trend is coming, so we could perhaps discuss some of the things, uh, some of the possible solutions to address these risks um, before things kind of get out of hand, so to speak. So um, I will leave it there, and then I will pass it on to my colleague. Thank you.